This is not a YouTube set. Welcome to my office. This book only has three chapters, but the main part is only two chapters. So I have done the audio of those two chapters. If you want the final chapter, you can read it on my website, www.michaelfortner.com. In 1916, a vision was published in the Weekly Evangel, the newspaper of the Assembly of God. This vision showed that two great attacks would come upon the Pentecostals. The first one was an external attack, which was successfully repelled. The second attack was to come from the inside. The elements of the vision point to this attack as being the rise of the Word of Faith movement. Pentecostal and charismatic Christians around the world are going through a great end-time spiritual battle right now, but they are mostly unaware of a great deception that has come into a large part of the movement over the past 60 years. This book is about that attack, the battle between traditional Pentecostals and charismatics, and the Word of Faith movement. Chapter 1 discusses the vision and how it is being played out today. Chapter 2 discusses two important prophecies that relate to this same inside attack with examples of some of the false teachings of the WOF movement. Chapter 3 gives some articles and testimonies found in the Pentecostal newspapers of 100-plus years ago that show great miracles and signs and wonders that took place, proving that they had great faith and did great things for God. Contrary to the slander made by the WOF teachers, that those Pentecostals believed in poverty and lacked faith. It is sad that so many Pentecostals do not even know what the Word of Faith movement is or what they teach compared to historic Pentecostalism. This lack of understanding that they are not the same has led many to listen to and be deceived by these wolves in sheep's clothing. There are manifestations within the WOF movement which never occurred among the early Pentecostals. The Pentecostals never had dog barking or chicken clucking as manifestations, which happens in some WOF churches. I explain why. Whereas, the Pentecostals had manifestations which rarely happen today. This is a short book, but it packs a punch. Chapter 1 A Vision of the Last Great Spiritual Conflict Here is the text of the vision as it appeared in the Weekly Evangel in 1916 but it was seen an unknown number of months or years prior. It describes two attacks. The first one was fulfilled within a short time. The second attack began a few decades later, and we are still living with the results. This is why the vision is important for us today. We are still in this great battle, and we need to finally win it once and for all. But we cannot do so unless we are aware of what the enemy has done and is doing. This vision will give us much information about this battle which we need to know in order to fight the enemy of our souls. Here is the text of the article. Evangelist Fred Eiting sends us the account of a vision which he had some time ago as follows. I was in deep, earnest prayer and had been searching the Word of God and the coming of the Lord was made very real to me. I was made to see that we are in the last days and that perilous times are upon us and that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. A holy longing and determination filled my heart that I might not fail the Master, but be true to Jesus at all cost. One night the Spirit of the Lord was heavily upon me, and during prayer the following vision was given to me. I saw myself with a vast army, mounted upon large white horses. We followed a captain who was also mounted upon a very beautiful white horse. My attention was first drawn to our apparel. All were clothed with white robes. What can this mean? I thought. Immediately I saw all were warriors and had on full armor underneath their white robes. I could see their swords and shields. We were riding through a desert country, but all seemed to be filled with joy to be counted worthy to follow so great a leader. All were in perfect harmony. We felt so secure and peaceful and courageous as we followed in close line. Every man knew his orders, but the principal command seemed to be to follow our captain and to keep our whole attention upon him. 
Presently, in the distance, I saw a great army of horsemen coming toward us, and as they drew nearer, I observed that instead of being clothed in white robes, they were clothed in black and were riding black horses. They were coming toward us at full speed. Their faces were very fierce, and they presented a frightful aspect, but I observed they had no armor on and carried no shields, as did our army. Their only weapon was a long spear. All realized that a battle was imminent and felt it was a decisive and final one. We looked at each other, and I could see some in our ranks turn pale. Others were so frightened they seemed ready to turn back, and as we looked into his glorious face, all fear left us and strength and courage came in its place. His very countenance seemed to express his will and desire for us. We were filled with the consciousness that our mighty leader was facing the foe and that the brunt of the battle was against him. The thought that the enemy must first overcome him gave us great courage. The two vast hosts met, and it seemed at first we would be trampled under their feet. But just here a wonderful thing happened. Our leader pierced the ranks of the enemy, and we were led victoriously through the center of that great dark host. The enemy was dismayed, frightened, utterly confounded at their being suddenly repulsed, and at the bold victory of our captain. Realizing their utter defeat, they turned and rode alongside of our army, seeking to overcome us in a different manner. Our soldiers, seeming to understand the change in their tactics, refused to make friends with them, fought with their swords, and defeated the enemy on every hand, as they were without shield and were exposed to our attacks. After a time, the conflict seemed to turn into a battle of words and strife. Again and again, I heard the Black Riders say, If you will not follow us or become one with us, please don't fight us. We want to make friends with you. But I noticed many of our soldiers refusing to make friends with them and continuing to wield their swords with great courage and indignation, cutting right and left into the ranks of the enemy. Others left off fighting and listened to their cunning and deceptive speech. I could see these begin to weaken and lose courage. The arm that had wielded the sword against the enemy became powerless, and their shields became heavy and began to lower, their swords finally falling to the ground, and in this condition I saw the awful attack of the enemy upon them as they pierced them as with a dart, and they would fall helpless from their horses. Often we would surround a helpless brother and try to assist him to mount again and join the ranks, and some were able to gather courage and take their places again while others were so weak and sickened they fainted by the way, never to rise again. Our time was limited. We could not tarry long in assisting the fallen, for our great commander's orders were to move forward and keep our eyes upon him. However, as a fallen brother would rise and again take his place, there was real rejoicing. We seemed now to understand the plan of the enemy better, and with a greater determination, gave no place for him in our ranks, but seemed to feel we were each other's keepers, and were bound together by cords of love, perfectly confident that our great captain was able to take us through more than conquerors. Behold, I have given him a commander to the people. Isa, 55, Rev. 1911-20. In conclusion, strengthen yourselves in the Lord, and in the power which his supreme might imparts. Put on the complete armor of God, so as to be able to stand firm against all the stratagems of the devil. For ours is not a conflict with mere flesh and blood, but with despotisms, the empires, the forces that control and govern this dark world, the spiritual hosts of evil arrayed against us in the heavenly warfare. July 29, 1916 the first attack against the Pentecostal people was from the outside, which the enemy did not win, so they changed tactics and began riding alongside of us. In this way, they began making many of us believe that they were with us. This tells me that the second attack will arise from within Pentecostalism by preaching and teaching false doctrines. People who believe those lies will become spiritually weak and defeated by Satan. It is likely that the first assault which Jesus broke through was the great amount of false teachings which arose and threatened the movement in the early years. These false teachings were a major factor in the formation of Pentecostal denominations, so they could control the doctrines. They formed a united force against the attacks. Here is an excerpt from an article in the Latter Rain Evangel titled, God's Word versus Man's Word, a Candid Criticism of Spurious Writings. 
This article will deal with a matter that has been stealthily encroaching upon the Pentecostal assemblies, preying upon the credulity of well-meaning and simple-hearted people who honestly desire more of God. We feel it is time to speak out and warn those who are being seduced by so-called prophetic utterances, purporting to be the voice of God coming with the authority of sacred scripture. We refer to the books entitled In School with the Holy Ghost, Honey Out of the Rock, and the Letters from Jesus. The instructions, rebukes, and prophetic utterances are for the most part so utterly absurd and foolish it seems a waste of time to answer them, but precious souls are being led astray and the cause of Christ is brought into disrepute. Page 13. Now a word as to the teaching of these books on sin. We confess to being shocked by this way of dealing with sin. It seems akin to Christian science which teaches that sin is made null to us by a denial of its reality. The following passages are selected from Book 5. That which is wrong in you is not yours. It is not counted to you. You are not under any responsibility for it. I in my death dealt with every wrong thought. So then, when wrong thoughts come, there is no condemnation for them. You have no sin. The sin that lieth in you is not yours. The old nature in you that won't behave and won't be free and good is nothing that you need to be condemned for. Page 17. Nothing brings such discredit to the cause of Christ and keeps outsiders from entering into salvation as to see Christians professing a holiness they do not have in their daily walk, and nothing so shoots believers out from the realization of true holiness as resting in the falsy assumption that the sin they commit is not theirs. On page 69 is the following, You can't think wrong, for I am thinking for you. You can't be wrong, for I am being for you. Tell Re, Deck, 1912, Peter 17. This sounds a lot like New Age mumbo-jumbo teaching. But that falsehood did not get a foothold in the Pentecostal movement, so it was successfully defeated. Those books cannot even be found online today. Because of Satan's defeat, he decided to change his plan of attack. Here are some important points from the vision. They turned and rode alongside of our army, seeking to overcome us in a different manner. The conflict seemed to turn into a battle of words and strife. If you will not follow us or become one with us, please don't fight us. We want to make friends with you. Left off fighting and listened to their cunning and deceptive speech. This vision happened over 110 years ago. This means this attack has already happened, and it was successful. This shows us false teaching rising up within the Pentecostal movement. This false movement has already spread inside Pentecostalism. Notice that the vision said the battle was one of words and strife. This refers to the Word of Faith movement that was started by Kenneth Hagin in the 1950s, who was an Assembly of God preacher. He taught that it was all about your words, that you should claim how much money you need, confess what you want, and you will get it. He wrote a little book called You Can Have What You Say. He said you can get whatever you want from God. All you have to do is follow the steps he gave, which was mainly saying what you wanted out loud, and you actually had to tell people in order for it to work. In the vision, the false brethren said, Don't fight us, and we want to be friends. Paul Crouch was the son of an AOG missionary, but he swallowed WOF doctrine whole and pushed it on TBN. He would get on TV and complain about what he called heresy hunters who were pointing out the gross errors in WOF teaching. He would say that they should not attack the WOF doctrine or preachers. Why not just let the teachers teach what they want and let God sort it out when we get to heaven? In other words, don't fight us, and let's be friends. There was a time when I watched TBN, and as it happened, I was watching the Praise the Lord, Praise-a-thon on April 2, 1991. I did not realize that 30 years later I would need to reference the statements Paul Crouch made, but fortunately, Hank Hanegraaff documented it in his book, Christianity in Crisis, 21st Century. Paul specifically said, Let God sort out all this doctrinal doo-doo. Who cares? Let Jesus sort that all out at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll find out who was right and wrong doctrinally. 
page 233. If you are pointing out someone's heresy, you are not walking in love, right? Kenneth Hagin believed that his formula did not work unless you walk in love. Sounds good, right? Yum. On another PTL program, his son said this about him. I have never heard him say anything bad about anybody. In fact, people would come and ask him about some things about other people. And he might know something about something. After they would leave, mother would say, why didn't you tell them something so they wouldn't get in trouble? He said, Well, I don't want anything to come out of my mouth against anybody else. I'll pray that the Lord will direct them. And he said, I don't believe it's my responsibility to speak bad about anybody. PTL Program, April 23, 1998, YouTube.com So, supposedly it is not love to speak the truth or to point out that so-and-so is a false teacher. Yes, it is. What is not love is to allow people to be deceived and do nothing to warn them when you know that they are being deceived. The devil does not want people speaking out against his false teachers. The Apostle Paul and the early Pentecostals spoke out against false teachers. Why was I watching TBN in 1991? Most Pentecostals were watching and becoming slowly deceived. At that time, they did not understand the dangers. Because of this army of false teachers that arose, many Christians have let down their weapons and have been overcome by the enemy, just as seen in the vision. It has greatly weakened the entire Pentecostal movement and is threatening to take it over, at least in the USA. David Wilkerson warned us in the 1980s to get rid of our televisions, but he was attacked as being an extremist. No, what about Christian TV? Well, it turns out we would have been much better off had we not watched Christian TV. Thanks to Pentecostals sending in their money, today the WOF has become powerful and controls many churches and the majority of the Pentecostal charismatic mass media. No religious program is allowed to be on TBN that speaks against WOF. Most spirit-filled pastors who do not specifically teach WOF doctrine will not dare speak against the movement and will even invite WOF preachers to speak in their churches. But you cannot hug a pig without getting stinking filth on you. They hug them like they are one of them because they want to be guests on their TV shows to talk about their latest book. If they speak the truth, then they will be cut off from 75 to 80 percent of the Christian media. Satan is the prince of the power of the air, and he controls the majority of the mass media, including the Christian media. So he promotes his false teachers to prominent positions and does his best to attack the truth. Because of these big-name preachers on TBN, there are many people teaching that you should be wealthy. Fred Price, 1932-2021, was a follower of Hagen and had a show on TBN and said, I drive a Rolls Royce. I'm following Jesus' steps. Hanegraaff, page 58. He was as big a deceiver as Kenneth Hagen. Hagen and Crouch smeared and slandered the early Pentecostals by their false statements about them. They claimed they taught a gospel of poverty, and that Hagen was the father of faith, but both claims are false. I recently published a book with 500 pages of articles and testimonies from early Pentecostalism, which show that they did great things for God. It takes great faith to start on a trip around the world with 28 cents in your pocket, but that is exactly what Daniel Alry did, and not because he was broke, but because that is what God told him to do. But even that takes great faith. And in every church he spoke in, he never once asked for a dime, but all his needs were met. Pentecostal newspapers, messengers of an outpouring. Another preacher took his family to the train station with no money at all. And yet they traveled by train to another city where he started a new work. And one year later he had built a church that was paid for. Many other evangelists bought tents, and traveled all across the U.S. preaching in cities and small towns. They had many revivals with many saved and healed, and many churches were started. The pages of those papers record many great miracles, and revivals lasting for longer than the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola in the 1990s. Healings took place nightly, blind eyes opened, the lame walked. People dying of cancer were instantly healed. People who were barely alive were carried into the tents and left walking and running. So don't you dare slander the early Pentecostals?
Some of them were indeed poor, but they were no less well off than most other Americans of the time. My grandmother was born in 1901 in central Oklahoma. When they heard about the outpouring at Azusa Street, her older sister and her husband traveled there and got the baptism and were called by God to be missionaries to the Middle East and went. So even though some of them were poor, it is very clear that they actually had great faith. It is difficult to live by faith when you have a bank account full of money. Relying on God for your daily needs requires strong faith. Nor did they teach poverty, but what they did not teach is that God wants you rich. The Pentecostal newspapers have many testimonies about miracles of provision. The early Pentecostals were able to build many churches and support many missionaries because they gave what they had in faith, and God met the needs. But Hagen was a failed pastor and evangelist. He said in the video, Praise the Lord TV program, April 23, 1998, youtube.com, that he pastored four churches in 12 years. But his own website says he pastored five churches in 12 years. Why were there no big revivals in any of them? If Hagen had the power of God working in his ministry like any of those dozens of early Pentecostal evangelists, he would have been a great success. After pastoring, he became an evangelist for a year and wore out a car and had to sell it for junk to pay some of his bills, and was on foot. He was a failure until he began teaching his false doctrine. With Hagen, it was not about the power of God, but the words you spoke. This is what Hagen said on TBN. The Lord said to me, Don't pray for finances anymore, or money like you have. I said, What do I do? He said, Number one, you claim what you need. It took $150 a week to meet my budget. All right, then you claim that. He said, the money's not up here. I'm not going to send any raining down from heaven. I'd have to counterfeit, and I'm not a counterfeiter. It's down there. And it's not me that's withholding from your children. It's Satan, the god of this world. You first claim what you need or want. And then he said, you say, Satan, take your hands off my money. And then you say, go ministering spirits and cause it to come. Ebid. From that time onward, he no longer prayed to God about money, but claimed the amount he wanted. From Satan. He said, God said, it is not me that is withholding it from your children, it's Satan. So we are expected to believe that Satan is stronger than God and is keeping money from us. But that is false. It is true that Satan can attack our finances in the same way that he can attack our bodies with sickness. But when that happens, the correct response is the same. Rebuke the attack in the name of Jesus. Satan is not in control of your finances. Think about what he said. He claims that God said, The money's not up here. I'm not going to send any raining down from heaven. It's not me that's withholding from your children. It's Satan, the God of this world. You first claim what you need or want. In other words, I don't have your money, Satan does. Get it from him. Hagen wants us to believe that Satan is the one who is in control of all the money in the world, that our prosperity comes from Satan. Lie. Here is what we learn from the above information. 1. Hagen no longer prayed to God for money. 2. Hagen told Satan how much money he needed each week. 3. Hagen commanded spirits to go and cause the money to come to him. That should send chills down your spine. The Bible says God will supply all of our needs, not Satan. It also says God will open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. But according to Hagen, there is nothing up there for us down here. Oral Roberts started out as a true minister of God, but swallowed the WOF doctrine and became a false teacher. In addition to the prosperity gospel, he taught a fake Holy Spirit baptism. There was a time when I sent oral money to support his TV program and build his hospital that was not finished and had to be sold, because he could not afford to finish and run it. On his TV show, he taught people to just say whatever gobbledygook they want to say, and that is your prayer language. And then whatever you say next in English is the interpretation. Counterfeit! It is true that you can speak in tongues at will once you get the real baptism, which is then the Spirit praying, 1 Cor 14.2. That is different from giving out a message in tongues during a service, which is followed by the interpretation. 
but Oral's teaching had people believing they were praying in tongues when they were not. This is deception from the pit of hell. Kenneth Copeland teaches the same lie. I have seen videos of other WOF preachers who appear to be speaking in fake tongues. I grew up attending a Pentecostal church, so I can usually tell the genuine from the fake. His son Richard teaches that if you are born again, then you already have the Holy Spirit, and there is no need for a separate baptism in the Holy Spirit. He then proceeds to teach those in the congregation he is speaking to how to speak in tongues. He said in a video, How many of you are born again? Let me see your hands. Then you have the Holy Spirit. Now, you may not be taking advantage of Him. You may not be allowing Him to speak through you, but you have Him. This is fake, counterfeit. Satan does not want you to have the genuine baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is additional power. He can be seen on videos teaching this on YouTube. Also, notice that not only are words emphasized in this movement, but the vision said, a battle of words and strife. That same word, strife, as a verb is strive, which is defined as to try very hard to do something or to make something happen, especially for a long time or against difficulties. Dictionary Cambridge Org. This is exactly what W. Off teaches regarding saying confessions, that you have to confess it for many months and years until you finally get it. In other words, strive for it. Striving is not faith. W. Off teaches that you can make things happen with the words of your mouth. Hagen taught people to claim what they want. That house is mine. You can have what you say. Even if the owner does not want to sell, if you claim it, it will become yours. You just have to keep confessing it until you finally get it. Joel Osteen is also a W-off preacher, known for his false teaching. I found an official position statement on the Assembly of God website by the title The Believer and Positive Confession, adopted by the General Presbytery in session August 19, 1980, seen in August 2022. This statement appears to speak against W-off doctrines but it does not actually contain the words word of faith and is not even well written. Someone could easily read the statement and come away believing that it is only speaking against extremes of the WOF teaching. Here are a few excerpts. The Assemblies of God from its early days has recognized the importance of the life of faith. It has been given prominent emphasis because Scripture gives it prominence. It is important for believers to be mindful of the example in Scripture of being strong in faith, Romans 4, 20, 24. They must be on guard against anything which would weaken or destroy faith. Occasionally throughout church history, people have taken extreme positions concerning great biblical truths. The fact that extremes are brought into focus does not imply rejection of the doctrine of confession. It is an important truth. The Bible teaches people are to confess their sin, 1 John 1, 9. They are to confess Christ, Matthew 10, 32, Romans 10, 9, 10. They are to maintain a good confession, Hebrews 4, 14, 10, 23, ASV, about positive confession. This view goes a step further and divides confession into negative and positive aspects. The negative is acknowledging sin, sickness, poverty, or other undesirable situations. Positive confession is acknowledging or owning desirable situations. According to this view, as expressed in various publications, the believer who refrains from acknowledging the negative and continues to affirm the positive will as sure for himself pleasant circumstances, he will be able to rule over poverty, disease, and sickness. He will be sick only if he confesses he is sick. Some make a distinction between acknowledging the symptoms of an illness and the illness itself. This view advocates that God wants believers to wear the best clothing, drive the best cars, and have the best of everything. Believers need not suffer financial setbacks. All they need to do is to tell Satan to take his hands off their money. The believer can have whatever he says whether the need is spiritual, physical, or financial. It is taught that faith compels God's action. You can read the entire statement by Googling Assemblies of God, USA, The Believer, and Positive Confession. 
Unfortunately, it does not take a clear stand and actually name the word of faith. It should clearly state whether it is speaking against the WOF movement or just extremes in the WOF movement. The early Pentecostals had such great faith, I would compare them to Samson, but those in the WOF are like limp dish rags. I saw a video of Kenneth Copeland laying hands on people at one of his huge conventions, and the people not only did not get healed, but they did not even react to any anointing or power. His hand may as well have been dead. Kenneth Copeland and Oral Roberts brag about being rich, youtube.com. He had no anointing. There is not room in this book to discuss all the false WOF doctrines in detail, for that I recommend Christianity in Crisis for the 21st Century and A Different Gospel by Dan R. McConnell and Preachers of a Different Gospel by Femi Adelaide. In my own book, Satan's False Prophets Exposed, there are a few chapters about WOF doctrine, but it also covers other related areas. There are also several books specifically against the prosperity gospel, which is the most widely spread WOF teaching, and has infiltrated many denominations. But I feel compelled to mention a few of the greatly blasphemous statements. Kenneth Copeland said, God is the biggest failure in the Bible found many places online, and he called Jesus a little wormy spirit. Copeland even said that if he, Kenneth Copeland, had been alive 2,000 years ago, that he could have died for the sins of the world. If you do not know how crazy wrong that statement is, you need to learn the basic doctrines of Christianity. If Copeland were alive 2,000 years ago, he would likely have been Judas. This is because W.F. Doctrine teaches that Jesus was an ordinary man who went to hell, he did not even go to paradise, but hell, and yet was reborn in hell by the Holy Spirit. Lie. W.F. teaches that the death of Jesus on the cross could not have paid for anyone's sin, just ignore what the Bible clearly says, but that he had to suffer in hell to pay for your sins. Lie. Hunnegraaff says Hagen vociferously proclaimed that the physical death of Christ was insufficient to atone for sin. Christianity in Crisis, 21st Century, page 180. They believe that Jesus was an ordinary man who was born again in hell. Creflo Dollar said he was actually the first person to ever become born again. Ibid, page 184. This is the worst heresy that could ever be taught. The Bible clearly says that Jesus paid for your sin by his blood. Acts 20, 28, Colossians 1, 20, Ephesians 1, 7, Hebrews 9, 22, 1 John 1, 7. And the reason his blood paid for your sin is because he was the Son of God. I believe Satan targeted Ken Hagen because he was stupid. All you have to do is read some of his teaching to understand he was stupid. He said you needed to have faith in your faith and you cannot be saved unless you actually hear the gospel with your ears. Because of his stupidity, he was fooled into believing Satan's lies, which he then spread among many full gospel believers. Woff preachers likely have millions of followers, blind leading the blind. Considering how grossly deceived the WOF are, it should come as no surprise that Kenneth Copeland is lovey-dovey with the charismatic renewal within the Roman Catholic Church, and even helps finance Tony Palmer, who is an emissary between the WOF and the RCC. You can see Kenneth Copeland and Tony Palmer standing next to Pope Francis in photos. Not to be outdone, Creflo Dollar has endorsed and encouraged his church members to vote for Stacey Abrams when she ran for governor in 2022. She supports abortion up to the moment of birth. She also supports critical race theory and other godless lies. www.charismanews.com Many times, a false teacher will gradually begin to teach more and more false doctrine over time. Creflo has long been one of the most extreme prosperity preachers. In 2022, he said he no longer believed that tithing was a correct, biblical teaching. Pentecostals never taught his WF prosperity gospel, but they have always believed in tithing, even before Pentecostal denominations were formed. One of the main reasons was that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek long before the Law of Moses. 
Many false teachers just cannot believe what is true. They must teach one false doctrine or another. Most of these WAF teachers teach a boatload of false, twisted, and outlandish invented doctrines. Yet, Christians keep sending them millions of dollars. The false Dabuaf preachers will gradually go farther and farther away from the truth. A video showed Creflo Dollar standing in his church, and he said, I just want to say this because I want to see how it sounds. Governor Stacey Abrams just walked in. I'm so glad to see you again. So you already know what to do, right? How many of you have already done it? Make it happen. Novator 7. This is why you never test God, the channel, is Gospel of Christ. She was running for governor of the state of Georgia in 2022. Creflo was telling his people to go out and vote for a woman who supports killing babies up to the moment of birth and critical race theory. Think about that. A man who claims to preach the gospel, supporting the murder of babies and hate for whites. Chapter 2. Two Prophecies. In 1965, Stanley H. Frodsham, retired editor of the Pentecostal Evangel, gave a prophecy at Alem Bible Institute which is still widely available online. In this prophecy, he said there were coming teachers who would begin teaching gross heresy after they became well-known ministers, and that God would actually anoint these ministers, because God will use them to purify and sift his people. In other words, test as God's timing would have it. After I first wrote the last chapter, I came across Stanley Frodsham's prophecy, which I had read at least twice before in the past twenty years, but I had forgotten the details. As I read it again, I saw clearly that part of it fit exactly the WAF founders and leaders today. But I warn you of seducing spirits who instruct my people in an evil way. Many of these I shall anoint, that they may purify and sift my people, for I would have a holy people. There shall come deceivers among my people in increasing numbers, who shall speak forth the truth and shall gain the favor of the people. For the people shall examine the scriptures and say, what these men say is true. Then, when they have gained the hearts of the people, then and then only shall they bring out their wrong doctrines. Therefore, I say that you should not give your hearts to men, nor hold people's persons in admiration or adulation, for by these very persons Satan shall gain entry into my people. Watch for seducers. Do you think a seducer will brandish a heresy and flaunt it before the people? He will speak words of righteousness and truth, and will appear as a minister of light declaring the word. The people's hearts shall be one. Then when the hearts are one, they will bring out their doctrines, and the people shall be deceived. The people shall say, Did he not speak thus and thus? And did we not examine it from the word? Therefore he is a minister of righteousness. This that he has now spoken, we do not see in the word, but it must be right, for the other things he spoke were true. Be not deceived, for the deceiver will first work to gain the hearts of many, and then shall bring forth his insidious doctrines. You cannot discern those who are of me and those who are not of me when they start to preach, but seek me constantly, and then when these doctrines are brought out, you shall have a witness in your heart that these are not of me. Fear not, for I have warned you. Many will be deceived. The entire prophecy is available on sermonindex.net and my website, michaelfortner.com. In the first paragraph quoted, it says, God will purify and sift his people with these false teachers. The Cambridge Dictionary meaning of the word sift is to make a close examination of all the parts of something in order to find something or to separate what is useful from what is not. The definition continued with an example. The police are trying to sift out the genuine warnings from all the hoax calls they have received. In other words, God will weed out those who will follow after a personality, a well-known minister or anointing. Or will they follow the truth? Even signs and wonders are not proof that you are following a true minister of God. God has allowed the WOF teachers and prosperity gospel as a sifting. It only draws those who desire the material things of the world. They do not desire to take up their cross and follow Christ. They prefer wealth. They are not true seekers of God. 
In 1965, Hagen had a 15-minute radio program across the nation. The worst he taught was his prosperity gospel. It was the same with Copeland, who began preaching in 1967. Neither he or Hagen then taught that the death of Jesus on the cross did not pay for your sins, and that Jesus had to be born again in hell. But this heresy they did teach after they became influential through TBN, which began in 1973. If Hagen had taught his lies about Jesus back in the 1950s and 60s, they would have kicked him off the Christian radio stations, which were and are still mostly not controlled by WOF. It was some time between the mid-1970s to early 90s that Hagen and Copeland began teaching their gross heresy. Notice that the prophecy said that God will anoint these false ministers. Even though they are mostly powerless, some of them do have a strong anointing, but that does not prove that their doctrines are accurate. God told us in Deo 13 that he gives dreams and visions and prophecies to people who teach false doctrines, which equates to anointing. And he does this because he is testing his followers to see if they will really follow him or follow the dreams and visions and prophecies. So, testing is the same as sifting. I saw a video of Kenneth Hagen at a big conference in 1997. He got behind the pulpit to teach but could not speak because of a powerful anointing on him. So he just walked around touching people which caused them to laugh, jerk, shake, and fall down, or slither out of their seats to the floor like snakes. I inquired of God about it, and the thought came to me that no beneficial ministry took place. There was no gospel preached, no conviction of sin, no salvations, no baptisms in the Holy Spirit, no Bible teaching, no healings, which means it was nothing but a bless-me counterfeit revival meeting. People can be slain in the Spirit, or jerk and laugh when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, which is shown in the Pentecostal newspapers of the early 20th century. But shaking, jerking, and laughing were all that happened in Hagen's meeting. This is exactly what Stanley Frodsham predicted, anointed false teachers. However, God caused Hagen to engage in some negative manifestations, which are intended to expose the error. I suspect I may have coined that term. On the video, you can see him flick his tongue several times in and out and around, just like a snake. One time might have been just wetting his lips, but he did it four times in one minute, then a few minutes later he sticks it out real far, flicking it all around. I have the video showing the flicks on my YouTube and Rumble channels. The video also has clips of Ken Copeland making some of his false statements. Sorry, but this is as clear as I could get it. Rodney Howard Brown is another anointed WOF minister. He can prophesy and even get people healed, but I have seen him on video speaking in what must be fake tongues. He is good buddies with Kenneth Copeland, lives in a multi-million dollar home and eyewitnesses testify that people in his meetings sometimes bark like dogs and meow like cats. This is more negative manifestations, which God is causing to warn people that the teachings of that minister are false. There were no reports of barking or meowing among the genuine outpouring of the Spirit 100-plus years ago, though there were some barking or roaring that took place under John Wesley but he immediately recognized it as being from the devil and that it was just an attempt to disrupt his meetings. They also barked and clucked at the Lakeland revival of Todd Bentley that ended in scandal. Though some healings do take place with WOF preachers, often their anointing is powerless. The anointing sometimes can make you believe you have been healed because the symptoms leave you while in the presence of this anointing. But once you go home, the symptoms return. Occasionally, this can happen in healings of a real healing evangelist, but not often. Other signs of this counterfeit revival can include such wonders as gold dust, angel feathers, and gold fillings in teeth. But they don't automatically follow. Those things come when they are specifically prayed for. In all of the Pentecostal newspapers which I read, which were far more than I could include in the book, Pentecostal newspapers, messengers of an outpouring, there was not one mention of such things as gold dust or gold fillings. 
Yet, a book published in 2013 claims to contain true stories from Azusa Street, including stories of gold fillings, one with a diamond inset in it, suddenly manifest itself in their mouths. Statement of someone who gave it a one-star review online, not I. But most people love to dream of such false signs and wonders and gave the book many five-star ratings. The author claims he personally spoke with people back in the 1960s who were at Azusa when they were young. So why did he wait 50-plus years to write the book? If any such signs had occurred, it would have been covered by the newspaper reporters who were personally there, or at least in the Pentecostal newspapers. But there were no such accounts. Frank Bartleman was a holiness preacher who became a Christian journalist by writing for holiness papers. He was there in Los Angeles with William Seymour before they moved from the house on Bonnie Bray Street to Azusa Street and was there the entire revival. It was his news reports and those of the Los Angeles Times that made the outpouring known worldwide. In 1925, Frank wrote a book called How Pentecost Came to Los Angeles which was republished several times with different titles. The most recent was Azusa Street, The Roots of Modern-Day Pentecost, with an introduction by Vincent Sinan, a historian, in 1980. There is no mention in this book of any gold teeth or any other of those false signs and wonders. Stanley H. Frodsham also wrote a book called With Signs Following in 1928, Revised in 1946, it also has no mention of gold teeth, dust, etc. The 2013 book has no verifiable sources. This means that the 2013 book likely has many lies in it. It was endorsed by Bill Johnson and Sid Roth. The reason the devil included lies in that book is to make people believe that those false signs are actually true signs, in the hopes that people will begin looking for more of those false signs, and when they see them, they will be fooled into believing that they are signs of the true working of the Holy Spirit. But it is a lie from the pit of hell. I have heard of one legitimate instance of gold dust appearing on the hand of a Christian being persecuted in prison, which was from God to let the man know that God was with him in his suffering, Satan's false prophets exposed. God's signs come for a reason. Why would God need to give such signs in the USA, especially when they are just seeking after the signs? They are just looking for some reason to go, oh, ah. The miracles in Pentecostal newspapers included several instances of genuine teeth. God healed people's teeth, but not with gold fillings, but with new real enamel and whole teeth. A true minister of God became deceived into believing that these false signs were of God, and so she began to pray that they happen in her services. The gold dust and gold fillings did not just appear in the services of Ruth Ward Heflin as signs following. I saw a video where she prayed for them to happen. When you pray for the signs, you are seeking after the gift and not the giver. In 99% of the cases, these are counterfeit signs done by familiar spirits. I bid. She taught another fellow how to pray for the signs, and they began to happen in his church. Both Ruth and the other fellow died of cancer within months of each other. I bid. There is a very high chance, 99%, that the ministers who have gold dust and gold teeth are teaching the prosperity gospel but they also pray specifically for those things to happen. They think they are praying to God, but they are not. The Bible does not include gold dust or angels, feathers as some of the signs that will follow the believers. In the ministry of Maria Woodworth Etter, long before Azusa Street, people would go into trances. While in the trances they would see visions of heaven, hell, the coming of Christ, Christ on the cross, etc. When they came out of the trance visions, they testified about their visions, and people believed and were converted. Some scoffers came yelling and causing trouble and would go into a trance, and when they came out, they were praising God and got saved. She had no concept or idea that any such thing would happen in her meetings until they started happening. They were the workings of the Holy Spirit. Many of the churches she started from her revivals succeeded, but some did not. 
because those people were only attending to keep having trance visions. When the visions stopped, the people stopped attending those churches, with the complaint that the pastor did not have the power with him that Sister Etter did. They were seeking the gift and not the giver. At least the people were seeking real manifestations of the real Holy Spirit, and not those worked by false spirits, which have little redeeming purpose. I believe the Apostle Peter prophesied about the WOF movement. There will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. 2 Peter 2, 1-3 Mevi I once prayed that God would bring down the WOF movement, but the Jehovah's Witnesses are still around. So are the Mormons. So I now pray for a clear separation between Pentecostals and WOF, while still hoping for the fall of the WOF. Of course, the WOF movement is not the only thing that has weakened the Pentecostals. There are other factors, but it is not the point of this book to deal with this subject. For more on the general spiritual decline of Christianity, see books and videos by David Wilkerson. The Pentecostal Church faces many enemies today, trying to suppress and supplant it. But until it faces the enemy within, it will not be able to successfully repel the attacks from without. I believe God wants to bring another outpouring of the Spirit, but the cancer of WOF needs to be decisively cut from the Pentecostals and Charismatics who believe in the historic doctrines of Christianity. The WOF must be called what it is, a false cult as bad as Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness. Would you invite a Jehovah's Witness to speak in your church if they believed in speaking in tongues? But the tongues the WOF teaches is fake. The Jesus they teach is just an ordinary man who was born again in hell. This is not Christianity. One has to question the wisdom and intelligence of any Pentecostal preacher who associates with WOF wolves in sheep's clothing. Stay away from churches and ministers that teach that Christians should be wealthy or promise a hundredfold return for an offering. The early Pentecostals had many examples in their papers of how God did not need to supply a pile of money for a preacher to do something great for him. It only takes following God and trusting him, and God will supply whatever is needed. Not a million dollars more than what is needed so the preacher can live in a multi-million dollar mansion. If God supplies millions of dollars, it is for the many needs that exist within his body. Not so. The money can be spent on a palace. Someone might say, what about the fact that some WAF ministers seem to get answers to prayers and get people healed, at least occasionally? Some Roman Catholic priests can also get answers to prayers and get people healed, and some even have miracles. But that does not mean that God is giving full sanction to their doctrines. God can be found in many different churches, but that does not mean that God thereby approves of all their doctrines. Some Pentecostals are oneness, so they do not believe in the Trinity, but God still works among them. They are far closer to the full truth than any WOF preacher. A more recent prophetic word was given by Timothy V. Dixon in 2022. He saw two great giants rise up in the land. The first one he called David, just for identification purposes. The second one he called Goliath. The first one was genuine. The second was a false copy of the first. I had a dream, such a move of God that it was sweeping the whole earth. But there were false, false revivals that were trying to raise up and act like that it was the real deal. I saw two giants, a humongous man that could not be defeated. But I also seen another giant that stood up in the land. It looked just exactly like the previous giant. And David stood up in the land through many prophecies of the power of God. And you seen great, great, great moves that has never been done before. Then you seen Goliath standing up, and when Goliath stood up, it was false. It mimicked, and it tried to act like David, but it could not. It looked like him in the dream. It looked exactly like David. I saw a scattering coming. The real apostles are not going to be scattered. 
they are not going to be shook, but the false, there is a false teaching. There is a false manifestation going on right now that it's going to make a lot of people be scattered because of what we are fixing to face. The false movement is demonic, false Christianity, false Christ, or the false Jesus. 926, 22, Prophetic The Gathering of the Last Harvest, YouTube, Timothy Dixon Channel. Timothy interpreted this prophecy to refer to the present-day prophetic movement, the true prophets, and the false prophets. But they are not giants in the world. I believe the David giant refers to the Pentecostal outpouring of over 100 years ago, and the second movement that mimicked the true was the Word of Faith movement. They are both giants in the land, but this prophetic word indicates that the counterfeit is going to be scattered. The vision tells us that Satan will attack the Pentecostals from the inside, which represents false doctrines from Satan that will cause many people to lay down their spiritual weapons and become defeated. This has happened to many Pentecostal people and whole churches. The Pentecostal church I grew up attending spoke out against charismatic doctrines in the early 1970s, but 40 years later it was teaching those doctrines. The main means of infiltration were TBN, Oral Roberts, and Kenneth Copeland's TV shows, and a few others. The two prophecies confirm the vision. They all point directly to the Word of Faith movement. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.